Good morning, Harvester. How are you today? I hope you're doing well. Let me, let me ask that again. Good morning, Harvester. How are you today? Excellent. Uh, if you weren't paying attention to what Don is saying, I know what you're thinking. You knew that Nicomas went on a trip to Nicaragua, and you're thinking, man, Nicomas, you're more tan than ever, and you grew a goatee, and you lost most of your hair. Don't worry, Nic uh, Nicomas is back, and, and he's doing great, uh, but he invited me to preach. Uh, my name is Gustavo Vega, as Don said, and, and I get the privilege to preach to the Harvester Christians that live across the river, right, in Lincoln County in Troy, Missouri, and, and I'm so glad that, that I'm here with you today. As we start this new series... Um, I want to start by saying this, that sometimes we learn to say the right words without necessarily knowing what they mean. Sometimes we learn to say the right phrases, but we don't really know what they mean. Now, let me explain this. When I was 15 and I was baptized, uh, I grew up in Mexico City in a church, a small church, about 30, 40 people, and, and the pastor of my church invited me to this class. And he said that I was going to learn, you know, some doctrine. And doctrine referring to, to the right beliefs, the right phrases, right, that we need to know as, as Christians. And one of the things that, that he taught me is about the Jesus' incarnation, the incarnation of Christ. What it means that Jesus is, is God and man both. And one of the things that he said is that the only way to say it right is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. He's fully God and fully man. And so I learned that phrase, but in my head, the mental picture was different. In my head, the mental picture was more like Jesus was Superman. You know, like during the day, he wears this suit and glasses, which by the way, I don't know how no one recognizes Superman. Have you ever thought about that? Just like how some glasses, just no one knows who you are. But anyway, Jesus wore sandals and a tunic, and all of a sudden, every so often, he would take him off, and his God superpowers would be in action. And while that's, you know, it seems okay, here's the problem with believing that Jesus is like a superhero. The problem is that we can become condescending of some of his teachings. We can become dismissive of some of his teachings. What, the way that it showed in my life, it was in, you know, in ways like this. Like when I would read scriptures about don't worry about anything, I would want to do that, but then I would say, well, God, you just don't understand me because you're God and you control the storms and you can make food appear out of nowhere and money. And so you don't have to worry about it, but I do. And then in teachings when God would say, uh, you know, just anger is almost like murder. You know, it's like, I, I get it, but God, you don't understand what I'm going through. You, you don't know what St. Louis traffic is like, Lord. <laughs> it's like, you are eternal. You have, you know, time doesn't matter to you, but I really feel getting older every time I get stuck on 70. And then this clown wants to get in front of me. You know, we kind of justify ourselves. And you, you pick the topic, whatever is hard in our lives. As long as you see Jesus as a superhero, we're going to tend to be dismissive of his teachings. And here's what I want you to, to think about today. Unless we grasp the depth of the incarnation... We will trivialize our calling to be like Jesus. How many times have you said, well, that's nice, but it's not for me. I could never do that. Jesus can do it because he is God, but not me. But what we want to wrestle with today is, is this idea that Jesus was fully God, and we know that part, I think, but also fully man. Could he be omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, yet at the same time hold the finite characteristics of human limited power of limited knowledge and wisdom this limitation of being at one place at one time could it be that even though jesus was fully god he lived his life on earth fundamentally as a man the apostle paul talks about this in philippians 2 6 and 7 let's read it, it says christ jesus who being in very nature god did not consider equality with god something to be used to his own advantage Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. One of the best illustrations that, you know, helped me understand this duality of Jesus' nature comes from Bruce Ware. Imagine this great and powerful kingdom with this wealthy king and strong king. And the king has everything that you can imagine, every privilege, everything, every commodity that you can imagine. You know, he wears the nicest royal robes, and he has, you know, any food that he wants, anytime. 
He is cared for, by the, cared for by the most skilled doctors. And he has this royal army that protects him, you know, his entire life. Yet one day he decides to go to the other side of the city. To the impoverished section of the city. And as he's traveling through his city, he realizes that there are beggars in the city. And for some reason, as he goes back to his palace, he can't get these beggars out of his mind. He just wonders, what would life be like if, if, he, were, if he were a beggar? And so he keeps thinking and thinking about it. So he decides to do something about it and actually experience it. And so he leaves his palace, he goes to the impoverished streets, he takes his royal robes off and he puts some tattered and smelly clothes of a beggar and he starts living as much as he can the life of a beggar. And so when he gets hungry, though he could call a royal chef, he decides that in order to live life as a beggar, he's going to have to go hungry or he's going to have to beg for food or, or find scraps and eat whatever he can. And when he gets sick and the impoverished, sick and, and this these impoverished streets because of all the illnesses around them and all the sick people and the, you know, the dirt and everything that, that's around him. He could call the royal doctors. But instead, because he wants to live life as a beggar, he decides that, that he won't. And he's just simply going to have to go without any help for his illnesses. And whenever he gets mistreated by someone passing by, instead of calling the royal army... Because he is living the life of a beggar, he just resignates himself to the mistreatment that he suffers. And I want you to know that when Jesus came to earth, when we say that Jesus is fully God and fully man, even though he still holds the kingship of, of God, the, the nature of God, his expression of the manifestation of it is, is muted because of his human nature. And just like this king turned beggar, he has chosen to live life as a human being. And he did it because he wanted us to know that he understands us. He wanted us to know that he actually knows what it is like, like to live like a human being. And that's what this series is going to be all about. I love uh, the, the way that Paul describes Jesus in 1 Timothy 2, 5. And uh, here's what he says. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. The man, Christ Jesus. I like that he calls him the man. Jesus is the man. But not only that, we, I think, know this part of God. We know that Jesus is God. In fact, you know, we take a lot of time to make sure that everybody knows that Jesus is God. But we forget that he is our mediator, that he is also a man. He understands what we're going through. Many times when we think of Jesus' humanity, we focus on the physical element. Right? We focus on, well, he, he was hungry and he sweated, he felt pain. You know, all these things. But we forget the deeper elements of being a human, like wrestling with emotions, with thoughts, with desires. And Jesus also experienced those things, yet without sin. And, you know, it's interesting because we need to understand the incarnation. You know, Jesus' incarnation, I want you to know this, wasn't just skin deep. It wasn't just an outfit that he put on. He lived our life in order to die our death and forever be the man Christ Jesus. He lived our life so that he could die for us, so that he could die just like a human, and that he could always be our mediator, the man Christ Jesus, as Paul says it. You know, today uh, we're going to explore, you know, part of Jesus last week. Over this series, we're going to look at his last week of life, and we're going to see how he started on a high note as he entered Jerusalem, and he ended on a high note as he resurrected from the dead. But in the middle, there's going to be a roller coaster of emotions that Jesus experienced, just like you and I, when, when we experience those emotions. And, and today, we're going to focus on one emotion that I think everybody has felt before. Have you ever felt deeply disappointed? Let me tell you of a time where I was deeply disappointed uh, in 1994, 1995, I was about 11 or 12, the first PlayStation came out. And it was a big deal. This tells you how old I am. I know I'm getting old. Uh, but I had the first Nintendo, and my friends were talking about this new console, video game console, called the PlayStation. And it was going to come out, and I decided to ask for it for Christmas. And uh, when I told my mom, my mom didn't even know what a PlayStation was. And so I played, what? Like, what are you talking about? So back in the day when there were commercials on TV, you know, I waited for a commercial. And I'm like, mom, 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 this is what I'm talking about. So I showed her. 
And when she saw the prize, which was about $300 or something like that, she's like, you're not getting that for Christmas. And I'm like, oh, yes, I am. You know how kids are, right? They think that with a smile, they're going to convince the parent. And so I, I, I you know, I, I just asked for it, and I was really excited. And, and deep inside, I really thought that I was going to get it. And, and here's what happened. I grew up in Mexico City. I told you this. And the tradition was a little different. There were no trees, uh, no, no uh, gifts under the tree. And so what we would do is we would do on Christmas Eve this family exchange with extended family. And then after that family gift exchange, my parents would bring out the gifts and then they would let us open them and we'd play, you know, late at night. And so that's what we did. And so I remember that one year specifically, I was so excited and we went through the family gift exchange and I just couldn't wait. I'm like, would you just hurry up? And I opened a pair of socks and a sweater that I didn't want and I just wanted to move on to the next thing, right? And I finally see my mom bring the gifts out and I see a box that just looked right. And I'm like, yes, I'm getting it. I'm getting it here. And, uh, but the moment that she handed the box to me, it's like something wasn't right. Like, you know a console is going to be somewhat heavy and solid. And the, the box just felt lighter and it rattled. And I'm like, oh, no. You know, all of my excitement turned to disappointment when I ripped the paper and I see the words Jurassic Park on it. Instead of getting a PlayStation, my parents had gotten me a Jurassic Park toy set. But, but, but I think I was disappointed for, for two reasons. One, because I didn't get the console that I, I, I wanted. But number two, because I think this was the first time ever that I remember thinking, you know, back about multiple things that had happened recently. Like I remember that fall, my mom and dad talking about finances a lot. My dad had lost his job and had gotten another job, and he said he didn't like it as much as the other one. And I remember for the first time thinking, are we poor? Uh, my, my parents don't have unlimited resources. And that realization and then just wondering about your finances as an 11-year-old, 12-year-old for the first time. For some reason, that Christmas, you know, changed the, the way that I saw the world just a little more than I expected. And you also have experienced disappointment. You've been called to the supervisor's office, right? Just to let you know that they're going to have to let you go. You've started a business hoping that you wouldn't have to live paycheck to paycheck just to get there and the business doesn't take off. And all of a sudden you're jobless and you have debt and you don't know what you're going to do next. You've been disappointed. You, you got married and the person maybe that you married wasn't who you hoped. Maybe the marriage is not going the way that you expected it. You've been disappointed because you've been wanting to have children for a long time and everybody else around you is having children and you still are childless and you don't know why. Disappointment can be a devastating emotion. It's a mixture of sadness and anger and hurt and fear because something that you thought would be great didn't come to be. In fact, let's put it in these terms. Disappointment is going to happen Disappointment comes when what is best is traded for what is less. Disappointment comes when what is best is traded for what is less. And that's exactly the place where Jesus is going to find himself as he is entering Jerusalem. Let's go to Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, if you have your Bibles with you. Here's what it says. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, the city he wept over it and said, If you... Even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's get a little more context here. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and, and Jerusalem was built on a hillside, on a hill. And uh, right next to that hill, there was a valley called the Kidron Valley, and then there was another mountain called the Mount of Olives. And on the other side of the mountain, a little village named Bethany. And, and so it is when Jesus is going on his way to Jerusalem, right before he gets to this little village called Bethany, where Jesus tells two disciples, you probably heard this story, says to, to, to two of his disciples, hey, go ahead of me, you're going to find a colt tied there, a donkey tied there, you're going to untie it, and if someone asks you, what are you doing, you're going to tell them, the Lord needs the colt, 
And, and so the two disciples go and they find exactly everything as Jesus had said. They bring the colt to him. And he gets on the colt. And, and before he does that, they take their cloaks off and they put it on the donkey. And Jesus starts riding up this Mount of Olives. And right as he gets to the top and he starts going down, then other people start seeing Jesus. And they remember the miracles. And they remember his teachings. And they join. And it turns into a big celebration. It turns into a big celebration, and they start saying things like, Blessed is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. And they put their cloaks right before Jesus as he goes by. Peace in heaven, glory to God in the highest. And it's just a big celebration. Now, for us to get the full experience, uh, I asked Nicomas, and, and, and I said, uh, if you would participate with me. And he said, yes, okay. So, so here's what I want to ask you to do. We're going to reenact. Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives and there's a big celebration because this teacher, this rabbi is going into Jerusalem. And you may think that he is going to be the next king of Israel. And so here's the kind of cheering that I want you to do. Remember when the, the Blues won the Stanley Cup? Okay, and they were coming to St. Louis and people are cheering and going crazy. That's the kind of noise that I want, okay. So here we go. In the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus is coming back and everybody starts cheering. Coming back, exactly. People are yelling and screaming. Keep it going. And in the middle of that cheering, as loud as it was, can you imagine? Jesus, for some reason, in the midst of a crowd, feels as lonely as he can feel when he looks down at that hill. And he sees Jerusalem on the other side. Let me show you a picture of Jerusalem. I had a chance to go to, this, uh, to Jerusalem in 2018 with Doyle. And uh, I love this picture for two reasons. One, you know, you can see the city, how beautiful it is. Also, it makes me look almost as tall as Doyle. <laughs> so I don't know if you were on your knees, Doyle, there taking the picture or what. But it makes me look tall. Um, but then right after I took this picture, I actually, this was cloudy. I got a, a little sun ray that came through and I snapped another picture. And man, it was just a beautiful setting. I wish it could be there. And I want you to just picture with all the cheering that you just heard. And Jesus is going down and is seeing this picture of Jerusalem. And he all of a sudden realizes what could have been for Jerusalem. He realizes all of his hopes for this city. And the fact that they have settled for less. They have traded God and the hope and trust in God for religion and wealth and rules. And I'm going to tell you, this is why Jesus' heart is broken, and this is why it says that he wept. He literally wept, lip quivering and everything. He was saying those words, voice cracking. He wept because he saw religious leaders that didn't care about people. They just care about status and power and wealth. He wept because this city on a hill, the city that was supposed to be the light of the world, was a city of darkness with poverty and injustice, and no one cared for, for those in need. He wept because he saw four decades later, 600,000 lives would be lost in this city because they, he didn't recognize the time of, of, of his visitation, of its visitation. Let me tell you, when you are disappointed, there is a danger, but there is also an opportunity for you. Because when we're disappointed, we feel sorrow. We just feel, feel sorrow and we wonder if God hears our prayers, if God's still for us. We wonder about our calling, right, and, and, and whatever God is calling us to do, about understanding God's will. We wonder if we've lost, you know, hearing God. So today I'm going to give you a do and a don't when you experience disappointment. Here's the do. Do you use disappointment to bring urgency to your calling? Use disappointment to bring urgency to your calling. Luke tells us uh, that after stopping... And grieving in Jerusalem, Jesus goes on to, the, to Jerusalem and, and he goes into the temple and drives out the people that were buying and selling stuff at, at the temple. And, but he forgets to tell us one, one detail that Matthew does. And so let's go open our Bibles in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 14. And here's where it says, it says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. And here's the detail that Luke doesn't mention. 
And the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Did you know that this is the last time that we hear of Jesus healing people in numbers? This is the last time in his ministry. And, and I tell you, I really believe that the disappointment that he experienced on that hill was fueling his ministry at this moment in time, just the same day, that same evening. He knows what Jerusalem could be, and he sees people selling stuff and buying and making it a business. And so he drives them out, and he reminds them, this is supposed to be a, a house of prayer for the nations. And then he receives all the people that were not allowed in the temple, and he receives them, and he heals them all. And that was fueled by this disappointment, this deep feeling and frustration that he had. And so I'm going to tell you, there are going to be days when you're going to look at your life and you're going to think, man, this is not what I was expecting. You're going to look at your marriage or even your relationship with your kids or your parents or your friends. And you're going to know that you wish there were more there. And you're going to want to give up on some of those relationships. You're going to throw in the towel. But I'm going to tell you, do not do that. Instead, let those circumstances, let those feelings reaffirm your calling. The people that God has placed around you need you, and he has called you to minister to them in a certain way, and you need to let that disappointment refill the sense of urgency in your calling and go back at it and do what God is calling you to do, just like Jesus did. Be the mom that God is calling you to do and the dad and the friend and the provider that you can be. So use this appointment to bring urgency to your calling. Here's the don't. Don't let this appointment steal the hope you have in God. Don't let this appointment steal the hope you have in God. What happens next uh, in Matthew's account, I think, is just a gift from God to Jesus. Uh, let's read Matthew 21, verses 15 to 17. It says that when the chief priest and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. I'm going to tell you that uh, Jesus is being faithful to his calling. He goes to the temple. He drives the people that were selling and buying out. He heals people. He's teaching. And even through that faithfulness, even that faithfulness makes the religious leaders upset. And it's like there's nothing that Jesus can do right at this point, right? It seems like everything is going right. And just out of the blue, children notice, children of all people notice what Jesus is doing. And they start singing, Hosanna to the king of David. Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. They start recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah. And I tell you what, that probably was the only reminder that Jesus needed to keep going. A reminder that his calling, in fact, would bring hope. His sacrifice would bring hope to those children. And man, I'm just going to take a biblical guess, but I guarantee you that some of these children were the same people that accepted Jesus later by the preaching of the apostles. It was these people that Jesus saw, these children, that, that Jesus saw the hope that was still there. That even though the religious leaders were against them, these children recognized the Messiah when they saw him. And they were singing to him. And I tell you what, we need to maintain that hope. Some of us are keeping this appointment right between you and God. You're holding it right here. And you go to God with it in between you two. And you just, you know, you're always keeping it there. And it's time that we let go and we don't let disappointment steal our hope. Billy Graham said this, disappointment and failure are not signs that God has forsaken you or is withholding something good from you. The devil wants you to believe that. The devil wants you to believe God no longer loves you, but it isn't true. God's love for us never fails. I believe just like these children probably encouraged Jesus, God will always send subtle reminders to your life, subtle things in your life that will remind you of his promises and that he is faithful so that you can keep your hope. So don't let disappointment steal the hope that you have in God. 
I want to say one last thing about this uh, experience Jesus had. Luke tells us the place where Jesus wept over the city. And it was that same hill that I showed you in Luke 19, 37. Here's uh, what it says. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives. So Jesus was on the Mount of Olives as he saw the city and wept. And I'm going to ask you this. Where is the place where Jesus offered one last prayer before being arrested and crucified? The Mount of Olives. It's interesting because I find it interesting that he would go to exactly the same spot where he felt deep disappointment. He would go right back to that spot to just cry out to the Father in prayer. And so here's what I want you to do when you encounter disappointment. I want you that from now on, I want you to make the place of your disappointments the place of your divine appointments. I want you to make the place where you feel disappointed the place where you can have an encounter with the Lord. Just like Jesus did. He made that hill where he saw Jerusalem and all that it could be and all that it wasn't. And he made that place the same place where he went to the Father in prayer and asked his will to be done in his life. Right there in your room as you curl up in speechless sorrow. You don't know what to do. Right there as you're driving and you're holding tight to the steering wheel and you're banging it in anger. You go to the Lord. Right there in your office as you bring your head down to your hands. Because you don't know what you're going to do and you're in despair. Right there you go to the Lord. Right in your neighborhood, in the streets of your neighborhood as you're walking in anxiety. You go there as you draw near to God. He promises that he will draw near to you. Jesus truly, truly sees and understands your heartache. And Jesus Christ, the man, truly knows how you feel. And if you go running to him, if you go running to him with, whites, with, with arms open wide, if you let him comfort you and encourage you and give you strength, you're going to be able to continue the call. You're going to be able to go back into the world. And fulfill the call that God has given you and he's given me. And the cross that he's given each of one of us to bear.